Uh, very good evening to everyone. I welcome, on behalf of uh, KCSI, I welcome everyone for this uh, case presentation. So, on uh, an interesting case of uh, upper limb ischemia. So, it will be presented by uh, Dr. Rachana, final year postgraduate, Kims Hubli. And the whole session is moderated by Dr. Gurushanta Payalgachin, Professor and HOD, Kims Hubli. And we have uh, 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 an eminent faculty, uh, Dr. Rajgopal Shanai from Manipal, Dr. K. Lakshman from Bangalore, and Dr. Ashok S. Godi from uh, Belgaum. And we have uh, Dr. Murlidhar, a uh, vascular surgeon, who has joined us uh, to give his expert comments also. And I request, uh, request uh, our chairman, Dr. Shuram sir, uh, to welcome everyone. Thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. A uh, very warm welcome to you all for this uh, academic session. Um, all our sessions and academic activities are aimed at all the surgeons, postgraduates, uh, whether they are rural, urban, semi-urban, or all the things. And all of them are going on very well and fully um, attended. I'm thankful to all the ACSA members and postgraduates for that. And today we are having a very interesting case. Upper limb ischemia is not very common. And also sometimes it will be discussed in the examination. And uh, Dr. <clears throat> Gurushan Tapai has appropriately chosen this topic. I wish you all the good luck. And Rachana can start presentation. And Dr. Gurushan Tapai can take over. Welcome, Dr. Gurushan Tapai, to you. Uh, at the outset, I thank all the, the members of KCSI for having given this opportunity to our institute and our department. And straight away, I request uh, our uh, the candidate, uh, Dr. Rachana, to start the case. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll be presenting today a case of upper limb ischemia under the guidance of Dr. Gurshan Tapailgachin, sir, Professor and Head, Department of Surgery, and myself, Dr. Rachana, final year postgraduate student. Uh, we have a 36-year-old female uh, patient who is a homemaker from, uh, by occupation, hailing from Badami, presented with chief complaints of pain in the right side of the neck since two months, uh, also complaints of tingling and numbness in the right upper limb since two months. Uh, coming to history of presenting illness, patient was apparently all right two months back when she developed pain in the right side of the uh, pain in the neck radiating to the right upper limb, which was insidious in onset, aching type of pain, which aggravated on raising her arms above her head and relieved with rest. Uh, she also gives history of tingling and numbness in the right upper limb since two months, which was um, uh, more over the inner aspect of the forearm and hand. There's no history of weakness of the upper limb. There's no history of changes in skin color of digits on exposure to cold. There's no history of swelling of the upper limb. There's no history of trauma to chest. Coming to her past history, uh, there are no history of similar episodes in the past. She's not a known diabetic, hypertensive, uh, asthmatic, or epileptic. Uh, coming to her, uh, there's no contributory family history. Coming to her obstetric and menstrual history, her obstetric score is para three living three with the previous regular cycles of uh, uh, 28 to 30, 30 days. Uh, coming to her personal his history, she consumes vegetarian diet with a good appetite. Her sleep is disturbed. Bowel and bladder movements are normal and regular. Uh, there's no history of substance abuse. Uh, coming to the summary of the history, uh, there is a 36-year-old female patient who presented with complaints of pain in the right side of the neck, radiating to right upper limb, and history of tingling and numbness, moreover, the inner aspect of the right uh, forearm and hand since the last two months, with, with there is no history of weakness of the right upper limb. Rachana, just hold on. Uh, I request... Uh, at history level, uh, just I request uh, the other panelists to have a little discussion so that we can proceed. Lakshman, sir? Yeah, Rachna, uh, when you're talking about this kind of tingling and numbness to the upper limb, 
would you be thinking of vascular causes also in addition to neurological pain? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you would. But... Yeah, you necessarily would because there is an overlap of symptoms. So once you consider that, you will have to ask for a lot more details. You can also have, you will also have to consider some vasospastic conditions or microemboli that can cause these kinds of you know, episodic disturbances. And so you will have to then rule out diseases that can cause vasospastic symptoms. So based on that, you will have to elicit some more history. So what are the things that you would think of? Um, <clears throat> You oh, talked about trauma to the chest. You know, the commonest cause, in fact, is trauma to the neck. You know, whiplash injuries are, in fact, the commonest. So, you know, any road traffic accident or a whiplash injury in the trauma part of it. In the vascular part, what else would you ask for? You will then have to, in your mind, go through the causes of Reynolds phenomena. Yes, sir. Uh, that's why I've uh, ruled out uh, Raynaud's phenomena by asking. There's no. Uh, she did not have history of uh, change in the color of her digits on exposure to cold, sir. I was okay. thinking of Raynaud's phenomenon, so I've ruled okay. out. So if that one thing, do you really think you can rule out the whole thing? I would submit that you can still. You still have to consider vasospastic yes. causes, not be classical color changes and you know reaction to cold, but it could still be that. So at your history level, you, I, I believe that you should be a little more wider, which means you have to look at possible autoimmune causes in your history, okay? Possible drugs that can give you this phenomenon. Are you with me on that? So you will have to ask about possible diseases that might, that might give you musculoskeletal pain, for example. Okay, you must take a more detailed drug history or make a specific mention that she's not on any drugs that may cause Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Shanae, sir. Yeah, uh, good evening. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Dr. Rachana, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Tell me what made you to think that this is a thoracic outer syndrome? This is my first question. Is it because you know the case and you have you've been told? If this patient comes to you in your final year MS exam with only this complaint, only this complaint, with no vascular, I think just has been a little bit of clarification has been done. What, did, what do you suspect? First thing. Uh, I would think of a neurogenic uh, cause uh, more likely oh. than a thoracic outlet oh. obstruction. So just so with this, is the, this is the exact thing what you people should not do in MS examination means to get the bias, number one. So one or two questions is, it is nice to think of neurological at, at present, at present. That is because there is no vascular thing, right? Keeping that in the mind, you have written as cervical spondylitis as your first diagnosis, correct? Yes, sir. At this stage, what, what is the reason for that? Uh, sir, she uh, primarily presented with neck pain, which was radiating to the upper limb, sir, with only history of tingling and numbness. She did right. not have any other vascular symptoms. Sir. That, that is so I, correct. correct. Now, but uh, yes, only sir. thing... The against this is her age. So she's a young female. So, but I would still like to keep it as a differential diagnosis so at this stage. In addition to the cervical spondylitis, what other things can happen in the posterior triangle with which can present like this? See, this is a classical posterior triangle lesions. Yes. Tell me. Neurological. See, is a, the thing is very clear. Tingling numbness. That's all. So, what other thing can happen to the nerve fibers somewhere? This is just to keep you alert about the neurological. Okay, any other tumors you can get from the nerve itself, either nerve or a sheep, it's very common in the posterior triangle. Yes? Mm. Uh, Schwannomas. Yes, yes, very, very yes. You should consider because in your patient, that's what I'm trying to tell. Don't get biased. So think of the cervical disc prolapse. See, not that you you can get a cervical disc prolapse without a trauma. Trauma has been already mentioned. Number one, any of the compression at the spinal canal level, plus neurological thing, schwannoma. If you suspect a schwannoma, this is what can also happen. 
you understand no so it should be thorough in related issues here at this stage of your presentation is it clear to you these are some of the points at this stage and what does it mean that uh, hand uh, what is the lifting up and all the thing you mentioned no um uh, so the the pain actually first first slide first slide history of the present that uh, summary you mentioned yeah. exactly yes yes, yes. Uh, the patient uh, uh, symptoms aggravated on raising her arms above her head so that made me think of uh, uh, the nerve root compression uh, there will be reduction in the uh, costoclavicular space sir on raising her arm above that, her head that, so yeah. I, that made me think in terms of uh, could be a thoracic outlet i agree with you one point because secondly any any muscle which is weak due to neurological not necessarily thoracic outlet Yes. when you try to move that whatever muscle there will be always fatigue and weakness is it clear it is not necessarily only thoracic outlet you should always say at this stage i am thinking in terms of all this nerve related because rest of the things you already mentioned here what is that change in color all that thing you have mentioned uh, these are my few comments sir dr gurshab yes sir sir gurshab at this level no 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 more questions Uh, all questions have been uh, already told uh, and uh, elaborated by dr rajgopal and uh, lakshman no more questions from my side yes yes sir uh, murli uh, for uh, ms uh, yeah. students uh, at history yeah. level uh, anything See, you would like to request them or any, uh, like uh, uh, tell them that uh, you need to highlight some history uh, some points in the history yeah. yeah thank you very much for this opportunity i'm really happy uh, so dr rachana what you can mention is that intermittent claudication in the upper limb i think you can always ask because whenever you are thinking of some ischemia in the upper limb you have to ask or elicit that history whether on doing the routine work is she getting, getting any muscular any muscular pain cramp like pain in the upper limb muscles because it is as you are leading us to take to the thoracic outlet syndrome like so you have to ask the intermittent claudication history whether it is there or not you have to mention then another thing what you said by raising the hand she gets pain you can also ask whether she is feeling weak whether she is feeling weak in the forearm or arm muscles especially these ladies when they travel in the local bus when they are standing they hold the uh, uh, pipe you know whatever that handle above so when they hold it like that and they travel for a long distance they get that weakness or pain so this is a very classical you can ask them and they will say yes when i travel i hold like this but i cannot i get that weakness so these are the i think points another thing you can ask is whether the patient has any headache migraine like headache for which any ergot the derivatives have been given to her for relief of this headache i think this may be a relevant point as dr lakshman mentioned history of drugs okay i think these are the points which i want to highlight in the history okay thank you just uh, one clarification uh, dr murli about uh, yeah. the intermittent claudication in the upper limb yeah uh, like what we elicit in the history for lower limbs uh, it is uh, sometimes uh, difficult to get this typical history for upper limbs So maybe the excess use of the upper limb in the form of working and then getting yeah. the pain and getting relieved with rest probably should we take this history as the intermittent claudication in yes, the upper limb? Yes, definitely. Because she is a homemaker, when she is doing the household activities, she will definitely get pain and she will go and sit and she may even do some little massage of the forearm muscles. If you elicit, she may come out with that uh, symptom. Uh, Dr. Shivaram, anything you would like to add at the history level? Okay, sir, shall we go to examination? Shall I, sir? No, sir. Yes, uh, please. Uh, yes, can please. Can we change the next slide? Yes, just, uh, just a few questions to uh, Rachana that uh, uh, no history of uh, diabetes, hypertension, asthma, epilepsy. This usual, uh, usual sentences you write. But I would have appreciated if you write something. The past is clear. Anything cardiac related? Will you be able to mention that cardiac? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the history of uh, uh, 
syncopal attacks or uh, a patient having palpitation, cardiac related? No, 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 no. Palpitation. Why should they have in a 36 year old lady? Um, uh, you tell something relevant to vascular embolic phenomenon for your information. Most common cause in this 36 is either embolic, either it's embolic or vasospastic if it is a vascular. So, what is the cardiac history you would like to take in these patients? Uh, yes, of uh, uh, rheumatoid stenosis, a young female, rheumatic heart disease. I will have heart disease. This is what is more important. And if this patient is a 55 or 60 year old male or a female with elderly? Atherosclerotic, ischemic heart disease, atherosclerotic. No, 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 no. Atherosclerotic per se is the rarest cause of the upper limb ischemia. Don't confuse atherosclerosis to embolic. Okay. This is the difference between the lower limb and the upper limb. What I wanted is post myocardial infarction, all that, you know, related to ventricle, all that. Thing. Clear? Atrial fibrillation, cardiac disease. That is what is more important in this. That's what I wanted. That's all, sir. Sir. Yeah, Ravishing, sir, you would like to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to know, first of all, why specifically she's asked for asthma and epilepsy in this case, upper limb ischemia. I don't know whether there, it has any relevance. Second thing is, I would, uh, you know, gently and respectfully disagree with Pro Professor Chennai because rheumatic heart disease is probably no longer relevant as far as the, because I don't think it is uh, a, a, a etiologic factor anymore. Uh, no, Ravi Shankar, he, he's worsening was uh, mitral stenosis with uh, embolic, causing embolic, yeah, yeah. Uh, cardiac source of emboli, causing uh, the peripheral uh, ischemia. Yeah, but not rheumatic heart disease anymore. No, no, what I, yeah. uh, commonest cause for uh, mitral stenosis is rheumatic heart disease. But it is no longer cause. relevant. It is. It, I think it is. Nobody gets mitral stenosis due to rheumatic heart disease anymore. Yes. Shall we go to examination, sir? Doctor uh, chat box. Yeah. Your questions. Chat box. Uh, that few of them have been answered and somebody okay. has asked uh, is the uh, injection to deltoid region is relevant probably uh, in this particular case may not be relevant because they will have more of uh, local uh, symptoms and uh, dr narayan has asked giddiness with physical activities of upper limb uh, uh, dr rachina anything uh, you can know, think of if uh, there is a history that patient gets giddiness after using upper limb yes sir. Uh, subclavian steel uh, syndromes okay Subclavian sleep syndrome. We are indicating obstruction. Uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, stenosis proximal to the origin of the vertebral uh, artery, sir. Okay, in the subclavian. Proximal to vertebral artery. Okay, uh, somebody has asked about COVID, whether patient had COVID in the past. Any relevance with the COVID and the upper limb ischemia? COVID uh, it, uh, is a hypercoagulable. Uh, Excellent, yeah. COVID is a hypercoagulable hyper condition. One and it is a known for vasculitis. Peripheral yes. small vessel disease, a patient can get affected at a later date. Okay, fine. Examination. Uh, coming to her general physical examination, 36 year old female patient, moderately built and nourished, conscious and oriented to time, place, and person. Her vitals at presentation were pulse rate of 82 beats per minute, regular in rhythm, good volume, equally felt on both sides, blood pressure of 110 by 70 millimeters of mercury, which was, me which was uh, measured in both the arm and it was e uh, e same on both the sides. Uh, she was maintaining saturation at room air. Uh, coming to her local examination, on inspection, there was fullness noted in the right supraclavicular fossa extending from lateral border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle up to 3 cm uh, medial to the anterior border of trapezius, which was smooth uh, uh, surface and pulsations were noted over the fullness. Uh, skin over the uh, swelling appears normal. Uh, dilated external jugular vein was noted. On palpation, a swelling of size 3 cross 3 centimeters noted in the right supraclavicular fossa extending from lateral border of right sternocleidomastoid muscle up to the anterior border of trapezius muscle uh, with ill-defined borders, hard in consistency and non-mobile uh, and transmitted pulsations were felt over the swelling. 
all the peripheral pulses were felt equally on both the sides. Uh, coming to the uh, uh, test, Adson test was positive uh, and uh, costoclavicular compression test, elevated arm stress test, uh, was were positive on hyperabduction of the right upper limb, uh, diminished radial artery pulsations could be felt. Uh, on auscultation, Brui was heard in the right supraclavicular fossa. Coming to the examination of the uh, peripheral nervous system, uh, tone was normal in uh, both upper and lower limbs. Power was normal in both uh, right uh, and left upper limb and lower limbs. Sensations were intact in both the upper limbs and lower limbs. There was no wasting of the hand and the forearm muscles noted. Coming to her systemic examination, cardiovascular system, yes one, yes two was heard with no murmurs. Uh, uh, bilateral normal vesicular breath sounds were heard with no added sounds. Uh, abdomen was soft and non-tender bowel sounds were heard. Uh, examination of spine showed there was no cervical spine tenderness noted. You are done with the examination? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, that's excellent, sir. Uh, you come back to the general physical examination study. Yeah, sir, you have to unmute, sir. Sorry, I was muted. Yes, I think you've done a fairly comprehensive examination. In the very last, you mentioned only about the tenderness of the cervical spine. Would you be doing something else with the spine? Movements, for example. Uh, so I elicited a test, sir, uh, for the uh, since we were thinking at the history level of a radiculopathy, sir. Right. I we did a modified spurling test, uh, which mm -hmm. is uh, done to elicit like to confirm radiculopathy. Right. Uh, it was uh, negative. Sir. Yeah, but as a general part of a spine examination, you would, I I really believe that you should still have to mention about the movement of the spine. Those yes. are spurling is a specific test for this. That's fair enough. But it's it, for the sake of completion, it would be nice if you have the movement described as well. I would like to know a little bit more about the swelling. You said it is hard in consistency. Yes. Sir. Is it so all through? That's uniform. What is the surface like? Was there any tenderness when you felt it? I think I don't think that was mentioned. So it's something again for completion of completion. Say you should mention these things. Uh, sir, it was uniformly hard, sir. Okay. And there was no tenderness. Surface was smooth. Smooth surface, no sir. Tenderness. Uniformly hard, non-tenderness. Okay. Yeah. That's it, sir. From your side. Thank you. Shall I, sir? Yeah, uh, Rachana, can we just change this next slide, please? Yes. Yeah, probably uh, since I'm, we are not, not able to examine the patient, it's better that uh, you can mention a clear margin or a boundary, like, you know, between the clavicle and the lower part of the mass. Okay. You are written that three centimeter medial, everything you have written, it's important that this area, especially between the clavicle, lateral end and the swelling, whether there is any clear border, number one. Okay, that is one. So I would have probably put it as a diffuse swelling rather than fullness. When you talk about fullness, pulsations noted over the fullness you have written, pulsation noted over the fullness, better. You can, if you can't make out the borders, you said diffuse swelling. That's all it is. I'm not sure whether you mentioned this, that one. I'm seeing one prominent vein there, whether you have mentioned it or not. I'm not sure. Um, I mentioned it. it. She mentioned it, yeah. Okay, that is, that is fine. So, can we go to the next one? Next yes, one. Sir. Yeah. Uh, that uh, you have written on this uh, pulsations, etc. Hard inconsistency, not mobile, all that is okay. Now, can you just go to the neurological examination, what you have done? You have concentrated on the pulses, all that is NFC. Next slide. The actions, osteoclavicular, everything. Sorry? Yes. Did you mention any neurological test? Your case is tingling numbness, correct? Uh, yes, I have examined the peripheral nervous system, sir. For the... Yes. It is, is it the peripheral nervous system is the type of everything? Very specifically, you should have examined 
We are written with no wasting of the hand and forearm on the cells, especially 48 uh, C8 and T1. Yes. See, what we are interested in? Ulnar nerve. Correct? Ulnar. So what test you should have specifically looked for? Rajana, sensory part of it is probably what Dr. Shana is talking about. Oh. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, touch Alnan... and vibration are yes. very important for sensory part of neurological examination. Whenever you, to, you are written tone, everything is fine, mm -hmm. but you see that important is what is car test. You should have mentioned this. Have you mentioned? Uh, I haven't mentioned. Sir. Uh, what is that test? A uh, car test is for uh, uh, to you know, mm -hmm. uh, elicit the uh, intracyser. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so See, Which is smart. supplied by the ulnar nerve. These are some of the fine no. The, see, the problem with the hand is very, very fine movements. So, intraship. So, it may not be affected. You know, they brush, suddenly when you see the patient, you will not appreciate that. But when you carefully examine, you have to mention that. Is it clear? So, at least uh, when you examine the... Arm. Arm means, sorry, the fine. Any clawing is present? No, so there was no clawing present. You understand that, but... Uh, Please remember, these are some of the questions which will be definitely asked. Okay? And these yes. are some questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Rachna, I, what, sir, yes. wants to highlight? Yes, sir. Uh, 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 rather, you have given a conclusion in the presentation that there is no wasting and hands appear normal. But yes. what, uh, sir, wants is that has to be concluded only after mentioning the tests which are meant for examining the small muscles of hand. <laughs> which includes thinar, hypothenar, intraoshi, and lumbricals. Yes, sir. So these are the four group, broad group of muscles in the hand. And each group has got some tests, yes. like chromate sign, yes. thought test, lumbrical yes. position, claw hand. So these are all the different. If you consider each one, if you just look into one test for one group, so that is more than enough. So ultimately, instead of concluding in the presentation, in the middle of presentation, if you have mentioned these points, sir, I have done these tests, all the tests appear normal. Conclusion is normal hand. So that's what sir is insisting. Sir, Godi, sir, yes, sir, please. Yeah, I have only one question. Uh, will you please go back to uh, the palpation of the mass? A yes, slight sir. palpation of the mass. Uh, I have a question regarding the transmitted pulsation felt over the mass. Uh, would you like to correct this, Rachna? Is it transmitted or expansile pulsation? When do you get transmitted pulsation? When a mass is sitting on the, on the uh, artery, on the you get a transmitted pulsation. Is this uh, transmitted or you would like to correct this or is you want to, want to stick to it? No, sir. Uh, it was transmitted pulsation what uh, we could appreciate in the patients. It wasn't expansive. No, you mean uh, the, the hard mass was giving a transmitted pulsation? Yes, sir. How, how can it be? Okay. The hard mass giving a transmitted pulsation. Uh, Rachana, please, please understand sir's version. Sir, please understand before you answer. Sir, what is sir is asking, please understand. Can that a hard mass transmit the pulsation? If that hard mass has to transmit pulsation, where should be a vessel? Should over the mass or underneath the mass? If it has to transmit. Over the mass. Mm -hmm. Then. It has to transmit, means it has to be underneath. So what is this, instead of transmitted, what you should have mentioned? There are pulsations felt over the mass. Sir, am I right, sir, Godi, sir? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Ah, yes. Pulsations should felt be. over the mass, that's yeah. all. What, what she's actually feeling is a subclavian artery passing on yeah, exactly. the rib. And that is an expansive pulsation. So it cannot be transmitted pulsation. Okay, that's the only correction I have to make. Rest of it is okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Murudi, anything uh, yeah. she should uh, add in the Kuta. presentation? May, yeah, maybe yeah. many Just, things from your side, but no, if no, we can no. make Just it short continue. and a few points. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Continue with uh, Professor Godi's uh, uh, explanation. Uh, Dr. Rachana, what you have to say is it is not transmitted. Yes, of course, now that you are convinced it is not a transmitted pulsation because a mass is not moving at all. Mass is fixed. Over the mass, the subclavian artery is passing. It is getting elevated and then it is dipping down into the right upper limb. So you are only feeling, you can boldly say that I am able to feel 
the pulsation of the right subclavian artery. You should say, because you have already mentioned about the vein. You have named the vein. Why you cannot name this artery? You can say, because you know you, it is examination and you know the nomenclature of the artery. So you can say that I am able to feel the pulsation of the right subclavian artery, which is arching above the mass. Then we will find out what is the mass and all that, that we will find out. But you have to mention. Another thing, whenever there is a survey, imagine you are now focusing on cervical rib. If there is a cervical rib and which is causing compression of the subclavian artery, there will always be a post stenotic dilatation. And if this post stenotic dilatation, what you are feeling, then you will have to be knowing that it will always contain a thrombus and it will always produce distal embolization. So you have to be a little more uh, clear and you should uh, describe this pulsation, whether it is just the artery or if the artery has got dilated and it is the post stenotic dilatation. You have to mention that. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, only just for I, clarification, yeah. in the presentation, if a candidate mentions about dilatation, yeah, there is not a clinical examination. Problem. See, it is examination of the right neck. What she is, is feeling is the pulsation of the right subclavian artery. If it is normal, she can say that, yes, I am able to feel the normal subclavian artery, which is arching, and I am able to feel the pulsation. If there is anything abnormal in the subclavian artery, she can always say because it is going to help in the management. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the candidate is within her rights to say whether it is a lump sit that she's unsure as to whether it is a lump sitting, a hard lump sitting on the subclavian or whether it is a prominent subclavian pulsation because of a, a lump below it which is pushing it up. Both are possible because clinically we cannot be very sure as to what is happening in that particular situation. So you yeah. can say it's a, you know, perhaps you can differentiate between an obvious transmitted and an obvious expansile pulsation. But as to whether it is a prominent artery that is pushed from below, okay, or whether it is a lump sitting on the artery that is giving you transmitted pulsation, I think it's very difficult to differentiate. And you're with, I believe you're within your rights to say it could be either of them. Okay, sir. Uh, uh, shall we go, go to the diagnosis and evaluation, sir? Dr. Grushantha. Yeah, 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 sure. Ram. One you... question. Uh, Auscultation. Yes. Not important. Yeah, she has mentioned. She has I mentioned. mentioned. She has mentioned. Yeah. She has mentioned it. Yeah. 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 One one question to Dr. Rachana. Yes, sir. Yes. For some reason, you didn't ask, get the brew in the right supraclavicular space. Any other place you can auscultate? it? Uh, we can ask the patient to take a deep breath, sir, and hold the breath, and then look for a brew, sir. Uh, in a hyper. Okay, I, I understood what you were telling. Just to. Hyper abduction syndromes is a part of thoracic outlet. Where else you can get a brewing? It's same thing. You continue subclavian artery, you will get that artery. You know the cause for hyper abduction syndrome? You are written there. Yes, sir. Pectoralis uh, minor ah, syndrome so, can. So, so you would have seen no axillary artery or vein during yes, the axillary dissection. Where do you ask it for an axillary artery brewing? Name itself is an axillary artery bull. So you auscultate in the? In the, the axillary. Axillary. Okay. So in other words, in a thoracic outlet with the vascular thing you are suspecting, if you don't get a brewy in the supraclavicular region, it's a good practice also to auscultate for the axillary artery. Okay. That's all. Okay. Uh, Rachana, is the uh, diagnosis? Yes. Uh, after uh, somebody uh, before we go for uh, examination, somebody has asked, uh, uh, Dr. Shekhar Goda has asked for uh, Allen's test. Is it relevant to do Allen's test in this case? Uh, no, 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 sir. Allen's test is uh, not relevant uh, in this uh, particular uh, case. What is it? What is Allen's test? Allen, Allen's test is to look for the patency of the radial and the ulnar arteries. Uh, 
uh, we uh, are make ask the patient to make a fist and simultaneously uh, occlude the uh, both radial and ulnar arteries uh, and uh, and after uh, two minutes we uh, ask the patient to uh, open the fist there will be paleness of the uh, hand noted uh, then we release the uh, radial artery compression if the uh, color so of the is, hand is just to know the dominant artery to the hand the ulnar or the radial. Okay. Dr. Gurshad I have one small other question or can I ask? Yes. Yeah, uh, Rachana, let uh, see so many tests have been mentioned for a thoracic outlet. That list yes. is uh, very big. In a simple way, when a patient comes to you OPD, like what uh, Dr. Mulidhar said, you know, she's raising the hand, she gets all that uh, features or something. If you suspect, what is the simple thing you can do in the outpatient department? Apart from all this uh, simple test, you have written no blood pressure to be recorded in both upper no. limbs. Is yes. there anything which is a simple one? You can record the blood pressure of both limbs and with the some kind of exercise or whatever you can call it as provocation of this limb. You find 20 to 30 millimeters blood pressure difference. That itself is enough to say there is a significant vascular compromise. Okay. These are simple things you can do. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Coming to the diagnosis question, uh, I would, uh, after exam history and clinical examination, uh, I would like to think of a thoracic outlet uh, obstruction on the uh, right side, secondary to. Uh, most likely a cervical rib. You substantiate your first half and the second half oh. with your history and examination findings. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, thoracic outlet obstruction because uh, the all the provocative tests like adsent test, uh, hyperabduction uh, test, costoclavicular compression test are all uh, positive, which goes uh, more in favor of a thoracic outlet obstruction. Uh, we all uh, since uh, all, we also did a modified spurling test to rule out the radiculopathy, which was negative. Uh, and uh, the cause for the cervical rib, uh, why I would like to think of is the uh, swelling which we uh, felt in the right supraclavicular fossa is hard and non-mobile. Uh, so I would uh, like to think of a cervical rib as the cause of cause for uh, thoracic outlet uh, obstruction. Would you think yes, of any, anything other than a cervical rib with similar findings? In, at, at this stage, clinically, would you entertain any, any other? I mean, I completely agree with you what you, what you said so far. But you could perhaps think of something else other than a cervical rib as well. Hard, uh, non-mobile swelling. It could also be an anomalous first rib uh, that can also cause a thoracic uh, outlet obstruction. Why can't it be a tumor on the first rib? an osteoid, osteoma, some kind of a tumor on the first rib. I believe it could, it's quite possible. So you must have an open mind about it. Yes. Yeah. So uh, one of the, in addition to the bony, see, this is a very classical case of the large localized bony mass. Can you think of anything other than the bone? First of all, we all know how to make a diagnosis of a bony mass. When do you say any lesion anywhere in the body is a bony mass? Hard and not mobile. Okay. Can you think of anything else which is hard and non-mobile but not from the bone? It's almost like a bone. Fixed. Fixed. It can happen in the supraclavicular region. Yes? Anything else you can think of? Heard of? Yes? yes? Try Lymph node mass. Lymph node mass, uh, yes, hard, you can get correct, but uh, you know, some kind of a nodularity you get, and there should be some, at least some, or if somebody has put one or two things in the chat box there, but have you heard of fibromatosis? Which, which can result in thoracic outlet syndrome like problem, sir. What sir was asking is, which can result in thoracic outlet hard mass fixed? Maybe, may yes. not be in this particular age group. Yes. So, so you have to keep it. See, in the examination, these are all the important things. Fibromatosis, somebody has put a myositis ossificans. I would have thought of fibromatosis. 
can cause this differential diagnosis. And in relation to this, we expect you also, since the upper limb tests are all positive, you have not done the other features of, sorry, other tests for pharmacos, correct? Yes, age is uh, not in favor of the pharmacos tumor. Yes, I fully agree with you. So it is a good practice to examine the other things also in this type of case. Okay, sir. Sorry, sir. Shuram, anything you would like to add at this point? But Shuram? Uh, no. Gurshantapa, I am unable yes, to uh, switch on the video, start the video. Unable to do that. I don't know whether uh, so, somebody sir, can you are, do it. You are, you are, you are you audible, sir. You are audible, sir. You can. You are audible, sir. You are audible. Uh, no, you video, speak, video sir. is not. I, I am not uh, on the video. Mm. My, sir, my you are not cam... able to see our videos. Our yeah, yeah, I, can, I can see. I can see. I can see. I can see. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Your video is not on, sir. Not on. I am not able to on my video. Okay, sir. sir, it must be a limitation in your system, sir, but we can Maybe. hear you and please go ahead, sir. Okay, all right. Sir, you just try. I will switch off my audio now. Video. I have switched off. You just try, sir. Now you switch on your video. <laughs> no, no. Sir, then you can speak, sir. You can speak, sir. Okay, it's all right. No problem. Yeah, go ahead now. I think we should proceed. Yes, sir. No, Shuram, no. anything you would like to add? No, I just want to ask. It, whether it she should give differential diagnosis or just say that it is thoracic outlet obstruction due to cervical rib, which answer you all teachers expect? Sir, I expect a cervical rib as a first diagnosis. Right. Definitely causing that tingling numbness. So neurological plus add some stress, all that she has mentioned. So that there will be a significant outlet syndrome. But the other questions which we ask will also help her to get more marks. This is very important because in the examination, it may be a classical one, but it may be something else. That's what we expect. I mean, even clinically, that is very relevant because at any stage, you know, the purpose of an examination is to make you a surgeon. So when you run your own outpatient as a consultant surgeon, yes. you will definitely have to entertain differential diagnosis. <laughs> the most obvious of diagnosis that you entertain in any disease, I'm making a general remark, can turn out to be something else. And you cannot yes. be surprised once you're once you're a practicing surgeon. So my urge, my urge all youngsters to always entertain a differential diagnosis. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just so proceed now. Yeah, yeah. Rachana, how do you evaluate anything? Uh, moving on to evaluation, since we are thinking of uh, cervical rib causing thoracic outlet obstruction, uh, I would like to get a X-ray of the uh, neck done uh, to look for the uh, cervical rib. Yeah, read the X-ray. Uh, this is a plain X-ray of the uh, neck AP view. Uh, uh, we can uh, see. Uh, uh, Hyperdense uh, shadow. You can from... use a cursor. Rachana, you can use the cursor. You are a co-host. You will be able to. Yeah, exactly. Good. Okay. Uh, we can see a hyperdense uh, uh, ma ma uh, mass coming from the uh, transverse process uh, above the first rib. We can see on the right side. Uh, then, which is coming and uh, anterior coursing anteriorly and articulating with the first rib. And as well, we can see a uh, hyperdense uh, 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 lesion, which is more likely of a rib coursing and uh, coursing anteriorly for a shorter distance than the uh, um, stand seen on the uh, right side, uh, on the left side as well. Uh, above the, at the, uh, it's at a level above the superior to the uh, first rib. Uh, this is the first rib. It is above the first rib on uh, either side. Oh, oh, oh. Do you see articulation? You described the articulation. Do you see articulation very clearly or you are doubtful about it? It's uh, doubtful, sir, but uh, we cannot see this beyond, beyond right. the first. 
you mean is it an is it a complete trip or an incomplete trip it's an uh, uh, here uh, it's an it looks like an incomplete trip so we cannot course it anteriorly beyond the uh, first trip it is not clearly seen not clearly seen okay but uh, rachna what you would have expected by your clinical findings of such a uh, Three centimeter uh, rounded mass, all that you mentioned, correct? Yes. Sir. Correct. So, what is the type of the rib which you expected, probably, which can give rise to local features like patient had dull aching pain, according to you, in the neck, and then radiating pain. Yes. A complete uh, cervical. Anything, anything you can improve on that little better answer, especially when you felt such a rounded mass, no? So bony expanded mass, bony expanded end, you know, you know the types of ribs there, which is the rib which cannot be seen in the x-ray, like this. Uh, like, uh, if it's just a uh, incomplete rib, anteriorly there's a fibrous band, sir, uh, which fibrous band cannot be seen on an x-ray. So, yes, okay, sir. correct. Uh, Rachana, if, uh, if a teacher insists that uh, you should have taken the lateral view of this patient. Yes. What would have been his intention? Lateral view of the cervical spine. What is the idea of taking lateral view in a cervical problems? So, uh, visualize the spine, sir, and uh, intervertebral so space. For Ramana and space. Cervical spondylosis. Okay, fine. Sir, Lakshman, sir, anything with pertaining no, to this X-ray? Nothing to add. Yeah. Uh, sir, shall we proceed? Further, yeah, further evaluation, how do you go about Rachman? Since we are uh, thinking of a cervical rib causing thoracic ob ob obstruction, we were, I would like to get a Doppler of the subclavian uh, uh, artery uh, to look for the steno stenosis and uh, post-stenotic dilatation, if there's any. Uh, uh, when we got a Doppler of the right cervical, right subclavian artery, it showed at the level of cervical rib, there was no evidence of luminal narrowing noted. And distal to the cervical rib, there was no Post-stenotic dilatation notice. Murali, anything uh, you would like to uh, uh, have a little more details on this? Yeah. See, in the clinical examination, you said there is a bruit. Normally, when do you get bruit? When there is some compression of the artery, you should get a bruit. Now you are contracting it. By color Doppler, you said there is no obstruction. And also, one more thing you have to tell to the radiologist who is doing the Doppler. As you said, the Adson test, hyperabduction test, all these positions, in all these positions, okay. the color Doppler has to be done to know whether there is any compression of the subclavian artery in many of these positions. And then only the color Doppler is complete. Not just the routine color Doppler when you, a patient is just sitting or lying down. No. The upper limb, right upper limb should be moved in many directions and then to look for any compression of the subclavian artery in all these positions. Then the report is complete. Yeah, even we were surprised uh, when we heard, because uh, it is uh, given by the radiologist, uh, we were surprised to see this report being normal, because clinically there was a bruise. Even uh, on table also there were some findings. So uh, really we could not correlate uh, these findings uh, with, uh, with our findings. Uh, but uh, is it uh, Murali uh, in different positions? Uh, is it uh, like uh, yeah? It is. Uh, it is very it obvious. Be. But uh, it should be done. Many of us probably we may not do it in the radiologist at least. No, may not no, be no. Doing it in the... See uh, a well-trained radiologist. When okay. you say that it is thoracic outlet syndrome, a well-trained okay. radiologist will always do the color because it is only okay. that that region of color color Doppler he is doing. He is not doing color Doppler for any other region. Okay. So okay. he has to Good. spend some time. And do the okay. color Doppler in various positions of the upper limb, okay. and then exactly say that there is any compression of the artery in all these positions. If it is there, he will say yes. If it is not there, he will say no. A very good point, Dr. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, exactly. I don't think any yeah. textbook has given this. Exactly. No, because we regularly get it done. And yeah. I always discuss the case with the radiologist. Um, I When he is doing, I will always be there and I will also be there to know whether there is any... No, in, in this case, as you said, he is normal. You can always get an MR angiogram and to know whether there is any uh, real obstruction and then post tenotic dilatation because once you said there is brewery, I think you cannot leave it like that. So now, what is next? Uh, Dr. Murali has already come out with uh, your answer. Uh, anything uh, you would like to add now? That's enough. Further evaluation. Because yes, there is no correlation between clinical examination findings and a Doppler. Yes, uh, I have a question, uh, Dr. Yes, Kushantapa. Yes, uh, to Rachana, uh, what is the cause for post tenotic dilatation? Uh, see, uh, venturi effects uh, like the steer, there is stenosis, uh, then there will the, be increased velocity of the blood, uh, blood sir, which uh, then there will be eddy currents. Uh, they will get uh, displaced and there will be a post stenotic dilatation which will be caused. Is there any neurological element also contributing to this? Because the artery is passing on the rib and there is abnormal kinking there, what you said is right. There are abnormal currents there. And also, so is there any uh, sympathetic contribution to post denotic dilatation? Possible so sympathetic. Uh, uh, it is uh, the brachial plexus also has a. Uh, no, not the brachial plexus, sympathetic nerves supplying the subclavian artery getting paralyzed, resulting in post dilatation is one of the causes for a post dilatation in addition to the abnormal currents. Yeah, to put it in a nutshell, uh, Dr. Rachana, it is, see, it is not the stenosis from within. There are atherosclerotic blocks which we find in any artery. The blocks are from within. In that case, we don't find post dilatation. We find post dilatation only in places where, like a cervical rib causing external compression on the artery, then you get a post dilatation and then there will be weakness of that portion of the artery. Yes. Yeah, proceed. Okay, yeah. proceed. What is further evaluation? We got a uh, CT uh, angio of the uh, neck and the uh, right upper limb. Uh, this was the uh, CT angio uh, image uh, with a 3D reconstruction image. Uh, uh, and we could see uh, this is the uh, first rib. Uh, this is the clavicle. And uh, this uh, uh, is between the first rib. And uh, we can see a, a hyperdense uh, lesion, uh, more likely of a cervical rib. And this is the subclavian artery, which is coursing over the cervical uh, rib. Okay, that confirms your diagnosis of cervical rib? Yes, sir. Okay. This is a diagrammatic representation of the CT. Your yes, diagram here. Yes, the diagrammatic sir. representation it's, of the it's CT. It's a representation of the uh, CT, sir. At this level, would you like to tell something about the scaling triangle and what exactly happens in the apps in the presence of an extra rib there? Uh, some anatomy of a scalene triangle. Yes, a uh, scalene triangle uh, is uh, uh, bounded uh, uh, by the uh, uh, lateral border of the anterior scalenous muscle and the medial border of the scalenous medius muscle. Inferiorly, it is bounded by the uh, uh, first rib. Uh, it, it is where the uh, third part of the uh, subclavian artery and the roots of the brachial plexus, uh, they emerge out. Uh, and in this space, if this is the, uh, and if there is a cervical rib or any um, cervical rib in that uh, space, in the interscalene triangle, the space will be compromised. Hence, uh, uh, the patient will... Uh, space is compromised means exactly, can you Describe it much better. Uh, the cervical rib will be in the uh, plane of the scalenous medius muscle and will come and uh, articulate with the uh, first ribs. Sir. 
so it will and the break uh, subclavian artery third part and the brachial uh, nerve roots will be pa passing uh, underneath the uh, rib so the and, and under underneath the uh, subclavian Wait. artery will be coursing over over the above over the, the rib oh, above the rib, the rib and oh, yeah. uh, uh, the uh, uh, the brachial plexus uh, roots will be uh, uh, coursing between the uh, scalenus anterior and scalenus medius muscle uh, there will be a ch ch chance of compression of the nerve roots and the uh, kinking of the sub subclavian artery. Yeah, the, uh, you mean the base of the triangle is elevated by one rib. In presence of a cervical rib, the base is formed by the cervical rib. Normally, it should be formed by the first rib. When an extra rib is there, the base is elevated and therefore subclavian artery has to rise up and then go down resulting in kinking and the nerve nerve especially the nerve roots which nerve roots are affected here uh, mostly uh, lower which trunk nerve? lower c8 t1 roots are uh, c8 t1 c8 t1 also get uh, they have to rise up one extra rib and then come down into the uh, arm and therefore they also get kinked the c8 t1 lower trunk okay a little bit of anatomy here what are the parts of the subclavian artery and what are the branches of the subclavian artery? Yes, sir. subclavian artery is divided into three parts by the uh, anterior scalenus muscle. Uh, the first part of the uh, subclavian artery gives rise to the vertebral artery, internal thoracic artery, and the thyrocervical trunk. The second part, which is underneath the anterior scalenus muscle, gives rise to the costocervical trunk. And... Uh, uh, the third part, which is on the uh, lateral border of the uh, scalenus anterior muscle, gives rise to the dorsal scapula. Okay. I is this possible to uh, get the subclavian steel syndrome in this condition? There was a question, no? subclavian steel syndrome. In this case, consider this case, is it possible to get subclavian steel in this particular case? You answered this, yes, Rachana, earlier. Yes, uh, it is it's not a question possible. of where the block is. You mentioned it earlier. Yes, it is not possible, sir, because yeah. uh, in the cervical rib in the interscalenic triangle, where the third part of the subclavian artery uh, courses, uh, subclavian steel syndrome is the first part of stenosis of the subclavian artery proximal to the origin the of the uh, vertebral artery. Which is a right. Okay. All right. Uh, there are a few questions in the chat box. Uh, uh, Murli, uh, there is a question uh, by Dr. Klaivani. Uh, is MRI NGO is preferable or reconstruction of CT NGO will suffice for the diagnosis of this case? Uh, sir, Lakshman, sir, anything they would like no. to Dr. Murli has to unmute. Murli has to Dr. Murli, unmute. Okay. Please. See, it is always better to get an MR angiogram rather than a CT angio because CT angio is always a reconstructed image. Many times they may not reconstruct. Even now, I feel you should get an MR angiogram because if you observe, enlarge that uh, image and closely observe, there is a small dilatation of the subclavian artery near the insertion of the scalene anticus, uh, anterior scalene muscle. So, Better you get an MR angiogram. Okay. Now, other thing is anatomy. You are not able to tell the anatomy of the subclavian artery properly. See, the scalene, scalenus anticus muscle, the proximal is the first part. Behind the scalenus anticus is the second part. From the lateral border of the scalenus anticus to the lateral border of the first rib is the third part. So, axillary artery starts from the outer border of the first rib to the inferior border of the teres minor. Okay. That is the thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have one. In uh, fact, uh, this patient, I have, I have one doubt uh, uh, to Dr. Murli. Please, sir. Uh, does MR angio uh, influence the treatment in this particular case? Is uh, my doubt. Yeah. Does it influence the influence yes. the treatment? No. Yes. And because see, no. When we go to the treatment, I think I don't want to uh, overtake uh, Dr. Rachana. When we plan the treatment, we are we are not at all planning anything on the subclavian artery as if you consider the CT angio. 
But if you consider, uh, if you do an MR angio, and if you know that there is always, there is a, uh, from outside, there is a compression of the subclavian artery with post-enotic dilatation. And of course, the thrombus in the post-enotic dilatation, we have to plan in a different way. So I think there is always a difference of, difference in the management if you get an MR angio and if you prove that there is uh, some disease in the subclavian artery. Okay, we can just come to back to this uh, when she, when she, to, uh, we can come back to this question when she describes the, you know, treatment. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, at this point, Murali, shall I convey to our postgraduates who are, who are attending this program uh, yeah. with the permission of Dr. Lakshman, uh, shall I make it as simple like this? There are chances, if you do only CT NGO, there are chances that you, we may miss pathology in the vascular system that is a subclavian artery. Which yes. will which will direct us what exactly we should be doing while operating. Correct. Is that the that the way we should? So if the question is asked, what is the advantage of doing a MRI NGO versus reconstruction CT? If the question is asked to postgraduates, if they answer that probably we may get more information about the vascular pathology in yes. MRI NGO better than better. in CT. If they answer, uh, shall we take this? Yes. <laughs> See, exactly. always. Okay. MR angio okay. or a conventional uh, angio is better than a CT angio, which is reconstructed by the radiologist. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, Rachana, what, what do you would like to do next? Not, not thanking, what if? Yes, uh, I, we would like, uh, like to uh, um, Go ahead with the uh, uh, surgery, sir. Uh, with along with the routine investigation and uh, workup of the patient, uh, we would uh, like to plan for a uh, plan for a uh, extra periosteal uh, resection of the uh, right cervical uh, rib uh, with anterior uh, sclerectomy. And uh, uh, based on the intraoperative, uh, uh, since the CT angio did not reveal any stenosis or post stenotic dilatation, we would like to. Uh, um, take a call on the vas uh, vascular part of the surgery based on the intraop findings. Yeah, Dr. Murali has put a question. Uh, what is the role of DSA? What is DSA? Digital Subtraction Angiography, sir. It is the uh, okay. conventional uh, angiography. Murali, you have to unmute. Murali, unmute. Sorry. See, if you have the facility, it is better to do a digital subtraction angiogram because if there is a only a stenosis of the subclavian artery, you can always put a balloon and stent and uh, you don't have to do anything intervention during surgery. You can just go excise the cervical rib and come back. But uh, in case there is definitely post-stenotic dilatation with damage to the subclavian artery, maybe that portion of the subclavian artery may have to be sacrificed with interposition of a saphenous vein or a synthetic graft. Uh, uh, sir, Lakshman, sir, uh, should the, should the, we should be asking about how exactly it is being done, procedure? Mm, I'm not sure. I do not think I would ask uh, my you know, an examinee uh, the exact I, procedures. Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Shanai, sir. Yeah. Shanai, sir. Yeah. Can, nothing but that what we probably will ask a few questions is that uh, now that uh, CT scan MRI has clearly told, so if you find only the sometime doubtful situation of a, this rib causing problem or something, what is the few things which you will do? Uh, Rachana, you are there? Yes. Now you understood? You understood sir's question? Yes. Uh, we would like, uh, we can do a, a extra periosteal. Uh... No. The, the, no, that is. You have not that found a cervical rib on imaging, but person patient has got features of thoracic outlet. So probably there is a fibrous band. So, so what is that you'll be will be doing? Uh, we can uh, do an anterior uh, skeletectomy, sir, uh, because uh, there'll be fibrofacial bands which would be ah, causing yes. compression over the uh, subclavian oh. artery. We can go ahead and release that and do a anterior skeletectomy as well. If cervical flip is not found in traffic. So what are the your basic principles here that one already mentioned that you have to excise the rib. 
adding the word extra periosteal excision means what did you understand by that uh, we uh, along with the uh, we remove the uh, periosteal layer uh, also to prevent uh, recurrence uh, if we shine the periosteum there'll be chance of uh, uh, recurrence uh, regrowth of the rib and that will cause again uh, recurrence uh, of the thoracic uh, outlet syndrome symptoms so we have to remove the uh, periosteal layer along with the uh, uh, cervical rib so one is that uh, you have to do the excision part is very clear but then uh, Everything else you can do if you suspect a vasospastic element along with this. This, I think, uh, Murlidhar probably will give his expert opinion on this. Anything else is also can be done. It is like. See, normally in such situations, we will look for any weakness of the wall of the subclavian artery. As you said, the sub, the long-standing cervical rib which is pressing on the subclavian artery would have caused damage to the wall of the subclavian artery. So, the obstruction with the flow mechanics and the flow dynamics will cause the post-stenotic dilatation. So, both this portion, the stenotic and the dilated portion of the subclavian artery will have to be sacrificed and we will have to uh, interpose some sort of graft either the saphenous or synthetic, to see that you know, further uh, thrombus formation will not happen in that portion of the subclavian artery. So, Dr. Mulder, yeah. my question was, in the sense, in this case, particularly with the no vascular features and with this finding, okay. you will probably decide on table, correct? On table, yeah. The, to repair or remove that uh, thrombus, or, correct? Yes, yes. I have a question, Murshantabha. Dr. Rachana, I can stop sharing. Yes. Uh, uh, in, uh, uh, just a minute, uh, Shuram. Shuram, yes. just to... Sir, okay. we'll finish off uh, Bodhi, sir. Uh, yeah. There are a few things which we'll show so that the, uh, another five ten minutes we'll have a discussion on the case. Okay. We'll ju just Shall show I... a few photographs and a small video. Sir, uh, Bodhi, sir. Uh, shall I ask a question? Please, sir. Please. Yes, sir. Yeah. Do you want to add cervicodorsal sympathectomy in this case? One question. Secondly, how will you recognize scalenus anticus muscle? Is there any landmark? And what care will you take when you are actually releasing the scalenus anticus muscle? Two questions. Uh, yes, sir. Uh... Uh, we usually, usually to answer the second one first, Rachana, so that you will be able to answer the second one. Uh, yes, sir. Phrenic nerve uh, runs over the uh, scalenus anterior muscle from the lateral to the medial. Uh, it courses from a lateral to medial direction, sir. So while we are doing an uh, anterior scalenectomy, we should uh, 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 take care not to injure the uh, phrenic nerve, sir. Very good. Yes. First question. Yeah, uh, Sympathectomy. First question. Uh, if uh, we usually do not uh, uh, do a cervical uh, symp uh, sympathetic uh, tectomy, sir, uh, unless uh, the patient is uh, uh, it's not having uh, presented with the symptoms of the uh, 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 Horner syndrome, uh, that is compression over yeah, the... Yeah, that's my question again. Second yeah. question is, what is Horner syndrome? What are the Horner, components? Horner syndrome uh, is... Uh, 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 involvement of the uh, compression of the cervical. No, tell uh, the components straight away. Yes, uh, yes uh, un unilateral anhydrosis, uh, ptosis, uh, meiosis, uh, and enophthalmus. Very good. Where is uh, this stellate ganglion situated? Can you tell? What is the landmark? For, for, uh, under surface of the uh, first rib, sir, posterior. First rib is a big rib, it is a long rib. Where exactly? Anterior end, posterior end. Posterior ends. Neck of the first rib. Posterior end has what parts? Neck of the first rib. Neck of the first. Uh, Dr. Chalaiwani has raised her uh, hand. Madam, please. Uh, sir, in the interest of pages, I will clarify, clarify from Dr. Murli himself. Dr. Murli, this she we will prefer an MR NGO first or straight away go for a conventional NGO if we are suspecting vascular. Because if we do a conventional, it will be both diagnostic and therapeutic. 
so this is what uh, we used to do but now do you have any change of opinion no, no as i said see as i said dsa is always better in case you are planning to do a procedure endovascular procedure because in mr angiogram it is only uh, you will get the diagnosis you will not yes. get an opportunity yes, to correct we won't be able to intervene yeah. so but only thing is you have to have that facility yeah. to yes. do a dsa yeah. not in many yeah. hospitals you will get that opportunity but if you have yeah. a cath lab and if you have that facility you can always do a dsa and plan in case there is a stenotic lesion that entire portion can be stented and it will do the job uh, it will make your job easy at the time of excising the cervical rib yes that's what i wanted the pgs to understand it doesn't stop with excision of the cervical rib the underlying the pathology in the artery has to be tackled yes it both have to be done simultaneously or maybe uh, first the vascular component and later excision or whatever is feasible uh, in the in the Isn't examination only you will do that percutaneously i'm in the sorry examination in the Hello? examination better the pg should mention mri angio first because it's a non invasive it will give some information once yes, you have planned yes, for some intervention definitely conventional angiogram is yes. a must but yes. don't Correct. straight away mention conventional angiogram as the investigation to be done immediately after after x ray mention that okay and, sir uh, uh, dr shuram uh, dr shuram can she play one minute video and then yeah, yeah. there are few photographs so Please. that uh, our discussion yeah, yeah. will be completed correct shall she yeah uh, rachana you just play yes, that sir. video yes sir this patient was operated yes sir yeah, it was operated, operated. operated. same patient excellent very nice so there are while she is playing the video there are two questions one about why is what is the meaning of skilene and dr nuli asks what is whose procedure so if you could address that sir i don't know the answer for both <laughs> sanu has asked what is the meaning of skilene sir shanai sir I think some are even uh, something like that. You know, they that's what uh, uh, not very uniform or something like that. You know, these are the different type of muscles. That's what I understand. Right. Sure. Anything? Rules procedure. Rules procedure. Nuli sir has asked. Sir, is it uh, uh, neurolysis uh, rules rules procedure? Sir, Nuli sir. It is a uh, transaxillary yeah, approach, idea. sir. Transaxillary <laughs> approach for removal of the cervical yeah. rib. Okay. Um, yeah. Murli, can I play the video, sir? Um, Murli, just one one question I have. In the yes, absence, sir. in the absence of vascular involvement, is this neurological thing in the absence of wasting and all? Is it an absolute indication for surgery, or whether you can manage with some exercises? no 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 because see one thing we have to plan surgery in this case because see the, she has already raised a doubt that there was a bruy okay one another it's thing is video yeah. it's not meantime it's a quite a big uh, cervical rib okay. complete cervical rib so even later it may cause problem so it's better to go ahead with surgery right right one Sir? question from me is there a time for one question from me Sir, yeah. yes, sir, carry on after that Ravi Shankar. Yeah, uh, post-operatively, uh, patient develops a profuse discharge from the wound. What do you suspect, Rachana? Rachana Are you there, Rachana? She is trying to play the video, I think. Yeah, that is one question. Ravi Shankar, your question? Yeah, it's not, it's not a question. It's a ruse procedure. See, Roos is an American surgeon who is actually the, probably the most famous surgeon as far as thoracic outlet syndrome is concerned. Apart from the cervical rib and uh, the you know prominent first rib and things, he has defined seven different levels of bands of they are called the Roos bands. If you don't see the cervical rib, then you still have to investigate and find uh, if there are these bands which are causing the problem. And uh, Dayanan Nuli sir is correct that you know he. He devised the operation to going the transaxillary approach, resecting the first rib and also resecting the scalenus anterior muscle. 
and also if there are any other bands to you know sort of divide them so usually more useful in terms of neurologic compression rather than vascular compression excellent very nice dr rachana you share the video rachana you have to unmute rachana i think you are sharing the powerpoint stop sharing yes, next share the screen rather than the powerpoint and then you can play the video hello sir hello hello correct diagnosis the this of the excision uh, extra periosteal then you play the video play the, play video. the video yes sir स्केलेनस मसल We are here. The scalene, anterior scalenectomy is being done. We can see the uh, uh, ends of the proximal and distal ends and the lower uh, and the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. This is the uh, com uh, complete first cervical rib articulating with the uh, first rib. Uh, this is the extra periosteal excision of the cervical rib being done, and uh, once the, the cervical rib is excised we can see the uh, sepsis fascia also in the video i think you should say scalenotomy instead of say scalenectomy because you don't re uh, remove the entire scalenous anterior muscle yes uh, but we uh, remove a chunk of the muscle sir uh, during the no, you, you only segment. cut the scalenous segment. anterior tendon segment. segment of the muscle uh, uh, do you do scalenectomy or scalenotomy Do I don't think it is required to do a scalenectomy. Doctor Murli, sir, unmute. Yeah, yeah. See, um, in surgery, actually, uh, majority or a big chunk of the scalen anterior scalenous muscle is removed. So they they can always mention it as scalenectomy one. And I just want to make sure what you were doing the dissection. when you find such a big important artery it is always better to mobilize artery and loop it and keep it ready in case of any injury to the artery you will have to clamp it so if you have not mobilized the artery and if you don't have a control or loop passing around the artery you will find it difficult you know there will be terrific bleeding in by any chance there is during the removal of the cervical rib if there is any injury to the subclavian artery so better you loop the artery and at least one loop you should keep it ready yes right nice video demonstration uh, dr gurshan tapa yeah Excellent. yeah it came uh, well it was a beautiful case now uh, we could see in the video that uh, where the scalenous anterior with the fibrous band in the posterior side uh, there was a narrowing once we did that scalenectomy uh, we could see the lumen become became uh, equal both proximal and distal and uh, like uh, murudi what you are asking uh, like a uh, dilatation post inotic red absolutely it was not there even on table we yeah, could see I, nice pulsation i was also observing that yeah it was not yeah. there it is a normal no, no, subclavian yeah. artery which is beautifully done and anyway gurushan the congratulations to your team uh, think, nicely yeah. done yeah uh, uh shuram anything uh, shall we sir uh, lakshman sir yeah no i, I just i just from yeah. all the I just okay. want to say that Rachana did an excellent job. Congratulations! I think it was a very nice presentation. You are answering the questions very good. You are obviously very well prepared. Very nicely helped you to prepare. I am sure Dr. Gurushan Tapasar who deserves, you know, hearty congratulations for very nice moderation. You know, all together a very useful and a very purposeful session. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah.
Thank you, sir. I would like to thank uh, Gurushantapa, sir, for his uh, constant uh, uh, guidance and support, sir. Definitely. <laughs> Shanai? Yeah, no, very good presentation. And uh, uh, that, uh, that's rare. Upper limb ischemia is uh, quite uh, rare, especially cervical rib itself. So what is also important is to look into the other side, which has been already mentioned, you know, bilaterality. So asymptomatic, that is on the left side, I guess so. So right side is the symptomatic thing. So differential diagnosis always you should keep it in mind. Uh, if the atherosclerosis per se, don't say the disease, you know, in the upper lip, you know, embolism is the main embolism and mesospastic diseases. So you have to keep it in mind these things. And then uh, cervical rib is uh, something which you have bought it clinically because you found a hard mass there. But sometimes you will not get it. You will not get it. But you will have features of upper lip ischemia or claudication. That is the time all this test will help you. So but keep it in mind examination and neurological features. So very good uh, presentation. Well done, sir, everyone. And your uh, surgical, uh, this one, approach and other things also. Very nice demonstration. Uh, Godisha had asked, you know, three one uh, that uh, post-operative you find some swelling or discharge. So you are, what is that uh, one or two things you should keep it point complications. You one said immediate to phrenic nerve one. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, profuse it, discharge. I was asking the profuse right. discharge post-operative discharge. Uh, correct, correct. What do you what do you think? Leak. Kyle leak. Uh, we can think of sir. A lymphatic injury to? Could be injury to lymphatic sir. Uh, Inadvertent injury. Is there a which is that, uh, is there a, on is, the right side? Sorry, sir. Okay. It, is is there not, a, it is on is the there, left. Ah, thoracic duct is on the left side. Left side. What is there on the right side? Jugular trunks. Right, uh, right lymphatic duct. Right, right. Uh, right lymphatic duct. Jugular trunks. Yeah. Sir. It is jugular called jugular trunk. trunk. Yeah. And uh, injury to if you would, sir, as uh, I saw one uh, name, Simpson's fissure. So, so. What else can happen at the deeper? The patient can have a, a, a post, a immediate post-operatively pneumothorax, pneumothorax or hemothorax. Dr. Godi, sir, final comment? Yeah, he, she presented it very nicely and uh, we must uh, congratulate Dr. Purushantappa for uh, performing uh, this uh, operation uh, successfully and also videographing yeah, nice. it nicely and showing it to us. It was an educative uh, video for all of us. And I mm -hmm. think we should congratulate uh, Rachana as well as uh, Dr. Kurshan Tapa for, for excellent uh, uh, demonstration, excellent moderation, and a very good presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Shivram, just I wanted to add a few points. Yeah. Shall I? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I'll just uh, ask this, you, uh, whether no, Dr. Burlidhar, you would have done anything different than what okay. Gurshan Tapa, the vascular surgeon, has done? No, and definitely not. I think Dr. Gushan Tappa has done more than a like more than a vascular surgeon. Uh, it is it's only to protect the subclavian artery. Yeah. yeah, while uh, he is removing the cervical rib, where care has to be taken. Another another thing is by any chance, if there was a problem or a lesion in the subclavian artery, I think then there would have been a role of replacing that portion of the subclavian artery. So. Then I think in that case, he would have required a help. That's what. So when they are doing all these cases, they should keep a graph That's ready correct. or is it? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yes, Gurshantapa. Yeah, uh, sir. Godi, sir, this recording was done in my mobile, uh, oh. which I do editing myself. And uh, then, uh, in fact, I did everything and I gave it to Rachana to present okay. uh, in this session. Oh, it is wonderful. not the other way around. Thank and you. second, for postgraduates, I wanted to mention a few points for postgraduates. The questions about this case, uh, what will be asked in the examination, and also it is practically important in future if you want to operate on such cases. One, whatever she has presented, doing all those tests, definitely it is important. But you should know the principle of those tests. Ultimately, the principle is mm -hmm. you are going to narrow the space through which these structures are coming out and try to find out their results. That is a principle of those tests. Second, you need to know three triangles anatomically. One is interscalonate triangle, which she has described. Second is costoclavicular triangle, where the clavicle and the rib is involved. That triangle we should know. 
and the third is subcoracoid triangle. So each triangle, the, the, the last two are named as spaces. The first one is named as triangle because it has got three boundaries. That is scalenite triangle, costoclavicular space, subcoracoid space. The contents are different in from first to third. In the first, the artery is anterior, the, the nerve is in between. The second, both artery and the nerves, they come out and the vein come out through. And the distal, once they, it is subcoracoid, it is an axillary structure. So this anatomy definitely will be asked in the examination if you do well in the first half of the presentation. And the third, about the procedure, what all we have discussed, the known complications and how to prevent them, we should know. So if you, if you can understand the anatomy and the pathology and the mode of doing the test, probably every candidate should do well in the examination. Once again, I thank uh, KCSI and the team uh, for having given this opportunity to our institute and uh, my department. And uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Gurushantapa. Excellent job and wonderful presentation. And it's a, not easy for most of us. There are about 112, 113 people who had logged in to see such a beautiful video demonstration. And Dr. Rachana has done excellently well, she has answered all the googlies put by Dr. Nooli, Dr. Godhi, and all the examiners. I must congratulate you, Dr. Rachana. I think that was wonderful. You have done excellent thank reading. You. It's very understood. Uh, I thank all the faculty, Dr. Lakshman, Dr. Rajgopal Shanai, Dr. Murlidhar, Dr. Godhi and uh, doing excellent job. Any postgraduates want to comment anything or congratulate your colleague, Dr. Rachana? You can do that. <laughs> Unmute and do that. <laughs> Come on. Please do that. They're hungry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar? Sir, thank yes, you, sir. Dr. Murli. Thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Gurushan. Uh, before we, before we, uh, before we conclude, uh, there is a small announcement. As you all know that uh, May 14th, we celebrate Mother's Day. KCASI uh, is planning a small activity for uh, all the members, the life members, as well as the associated members. Tomorrow, I'll send you the flyers. The thing is, you just uh, take a pic with your mom and uh, a small write-up about her what makes you special or what make you her special or what are the qualities that you have uh, got from her. That's what we needed. And all these things, we are going to collage and make a small video that will be displayed in Midcon uh, Collar. And uh, the top three uh, will get an attractive prizes. Oh. So I request everyone to actively participate in this. And May 14th is the last day. We have given two days. Uh, and uh, where to send? Uh, to the WhatsApp numbers, everything will be displayed in the flyer. So, so I request everyone, the postgraduates and also the life members to please send this. Thank and you. Uh, on behalf of KCISI, I should thank Dr. Rachna for an excellent presentation and also Dr. Gurushanta Pailgachin for uh, moderating the session and all the faculty members, Dr. Lakshman sir, Rajgo Parashanai sir, Dr. Mulidhar and Dr. Godi sir for and all the members who have uh, positively, uh, actively participated in this uh, discussion. Thank you, one and all. Dr. Kalei, so just in, in this context, I just want to mention, uh, as you said, May 14th is Mother's Day. I just want to remind you know, everybody that tomorrow is International Nurses Day. So yeah. uh, we are celebrating it. So in case any of the major hospital, because we are dependent on the nurses and their services for uh, good post-operative care you know, as surgeons, so I think we should respect them and we should uh, make them learn like what we do. So I think uh, tomorrow is, be, is the International Nurses Day. So let us uh, wish all the nurses who are helping us uh, to do our surgery successfully and uh, let them keep their health well and uh, let them be qualified and uh, knowledgeable. Thank you. Dr. Kalevani, Scientific Committee Chairman. Yes, sir, thank you so much. We must thank Dr. Gurushan Tapa for doing such a great job. And that's thank what you, we you. can expect from him, sir. Thank and you. thanks thank to you. Rachana. Uh, you have groomed her so well, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Murli. And Dr. Godi, sir, always evergreen teacher. And of course, Dr. Shenoy and Dr. Lakshman. There's no comments about them. They're too good. Yeah.
Thank, thank you so thank much you to everyone. everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. 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 Good night.